All right, greetings, um, and thanks to all who are listening um, and joining us today for uh, the first case challenge question and answer session. Uh, my name is Alexis Janot. Um, I'm the program manager running this effort, and I'll be uh, leading this session. Uh, today, our guest um, is Dr. Dean Polina from the U.S. government's National Center for Credibility Assessment. He's going to be talking today about his research on credibility assessment and where this field is headed in order to help inform some of the solutions that some of you um, participating in this case challenge may be thinking about. Um, so the Q&A session today, just for informational purposes, it's just so you have a chance to hear from an expert in the field who's been thinking about credibility assessment, thinking about how to measure it, how to research it, and some of the challenges that there are um, in, in evaluating some of the tools designed to assess credibility. So we're not here to, to give you a solution, but, but hopefully some of what we talk about today may inspire your thinking and may inspire some of your solutions that, that you might submit later uh, down the road. So the session today will be recorded um, and we will be posting it to the HeroX Challenge site. Um, so just so everyone knows, we won't be taking any live questions, but we would encourage you if there are things that you wanted to discuss, um, go to the HeroX uh, forum page and then post your questions there and, uh, and we, can, we can have the discussion online there. Um, so, just as a bit of background, so uh, Dr. Dean Polina, he comes to us, as I mentioned, from the National Center for Credibility Assessment, or NCCA, where he's been uh, for almost 20 years now. So, prior to joining the research staff at NCCA, he had academic appointments at SUNY Stony Brook, and then came to uh, NCCA to follow um, sort of research pursuits in the areas of psychophysiological detection of deception, um, self-monitoring during truth and value judgments, and other linguistic tasks. Currently, his research is focused on combining traditional polygraph techniques with newer technologies um, to include things like thermal, um, standoff, standoff detection of various physiological signatures, and brain imaging. So we're excited to have Jean, uh, excuse me, Dean join us today. So Dean, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. Um, and we welcome you to this, uh, to this case challenge question and answer session. Oh, thanks, Alexis. Uh, gl glad to be here. Great. Um, so, Dean, I wanted to start off with, with a bit of background. Um, I was hoping you might just start by telling us a little bit more about yourself, kind of going, going beyond the bio, um, and how you came to be interested in, in studying credibility assessment. Sure. Um, well, uh, I earned a PhD in experimental psychology, uh, uh, as you mentioned, from Stony Brook uh, University. That's uh, in New York in uh, 1994. So uh, uh, during my time in graduate school there is where I started to get interested in uh, credibility assessment. I had taken uh, many neuroscience courses and I was very interested in, in um, statistics. Uh, I come from a, a working class family and I suspect that that contributed to my interest in applied topics. Uh, certainly, um, at the time of um, you know uh, that I was doing my studies, uh, no one at Stony Brook was really interested in polygraph per se. Although that was that was and continues to be the the tool uh, for credibility assessment um, that's fielded currently. Um, so uh, yeah, so I was more interested in applied topics rather than theoretical issues for which I couldn't see an immediate use. And the result uh, of my studies was a PhD thesis where I tried to use um, brain waves and um, EEG uh, as a lie detector, you might say, uh, as a neural lie detector. Um, the study was published. It was largely a no effect study, um, which shouldn't be, I guess I shouldn't feel too bad about that because even today, uh, no one's been able to build a truly effective neural sort of polygraph, although they're making great strides. Well, it's um, encouraging that you were able to actually publish that too. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, was, it was very interesting, and I, I think uh, an interesting piece of work. But like I said, it was it certainly wasn't uh, didn't result in any fieldable uh, lie detectors of any kind. Um, I think that uh, I think now that what was uh, needed and, and not yet available back in those days to accomplish that task was uh, artificial intelligence, which I think now is really really mm -hmm. taking off. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, since that time, I moved away from the use of uh, more CNS kind of measures uh, in my own studies, and we've done a few of those kinds of things here at NCCA, but not 
not much. Uh, somewhat ironically, I, I've also come to appreciate more the importance of, of, of theory, theoretical issues in credibility assessment. And um, in my view, the uh, most important of those would be, and I say this only half jokingly, um, what is truth? Um, you know, um, yeah, maybe Pontius Pilate was half joking as well when he asked the same question. But anyway, uh, I think I, I, I say that to make a point. I think some researchers in credibility assessment uh, disparage these kind of philosophical questions. Um, but interestingly, um, I, I've come to find that they are actually important. And uh, I don't know, have you ever read the book Lying by uh, Cecilia Bach? I don't, I don't know if anyone, uh, and I, got, I came across this book in grad school when I was actually doing my, my, my first credibility assessment studies and it's a very well-written book. I think it's older now, I think it was originally written in the 70s, but I think it really does shed, shed some light on what I think is one of the central problems in credibility assessment. And what she talks about is she tries to separate truth, you know, this this sort of philosophical grand word that, you know, basically encompasses all of philosophy from truthfulness, which is, you know, someone just trying to um, convey information that they believe is accurate. And she goes through the whole book. But in one of her, at the first few pages, she has an example, and I'd, I'd like to read it if it's okay. Sure, please. Um, yeah. yeah, so she says, uh, this is uh, early in the first chapter, she says, um, how can a physician, for example, tell the whole truth to a patient about a set of symptoms and their causes and likely effects? He certainly does not know all there is to know himself, even all he does know that might have a bearing, incomplete, erroneous, and tentative though it may be, uh, could not be conveyed in less than weeks or even months. Add to the, these difficulties the awareness that everything in life and experience connects, that all is a seamless web so that nothing can be said to be said without qualifications and elaborations and a sort of infinite regress. And her point, as she said, this book is intended as a reply to such arguments. And I think that that really, for me, set the, set the stage for uh, what I've been doing for the last 20 years in the sense that, um, you know, we try on the one hand to boil down these issues in credibility assessment to something simple such as, Lying is when you make statements that don't match in what's in your memory. That that get kicks, gets kicked around a lot, um, or something similar. And I do think that you know you know these kind of uh, statements they're useful or uh, they're useful as a sort of uh, to drive theory. But there's clearly more to the explanation. In particular, many studies, uh, I'm sure you're familiar. Many studies uh, have shown that memory itself is a creative process and not. Um, not like reading exact information from some kind of memory bank. And uh, that, I think, partly, too, is what I was trying to get at with the, with the sort of Pontius Pilate yeah. quote. You know, not, we're not to, you know, get this into a uh, discussion of the Gospels, but the point was, <laughs> you know, the point is that I, when I read that, you know, in the Gospel, I always assumed that Pilate was lying to himself, right? At least on some level, he was the, whatever he was, prefecture of, Rome, and he could have done something, right? And that's that's what I find in the uh, almost every day, even in polygraph, you you have this issue of people to a to a greater or lesser degree creating these memories. You might say lying to themselves, and that's it's a central issue in uh, in designing these kinds of uh, yeah. uh, what you might call mock crime scenarios. Right. So it's interesting. I mean, you point out a couple of different areas of sort of tension there. One being this idea of um, how do you sort of do something that ultimately has to be very sort of practical and applied um, in terms of how do we actually assess credibility in the real world, but, but then um, comparing that with, with trying to assess something that could involve self-deception. It could involve, uh, um, you know, questions of, of whether someone is lying, but it can also involve questions about someone's sort of ultimate sort of integrity, right? Or, or their belief system or their any, you know, aspects of, of their background or the fallibility of their memory. So I'm curious from your um, perspective or from your sort of position at MCCA and sort of the day to day, how do you think about really sort of operationalizing and measuring credibility, given that, that there is a sort of world of ways to sort of define and think about it from the theoretical to the more practical? Yeah, 
Um, well, I think that for for the, for the most part, um, measuring, <laughs> yeah, credibility is is a, is a tricky thing. What we obviously do. Uh, and as I said, we don't do much brain uh, uh, CNS kind of research here. We have to infer things. We, you know, as as people will always say, um, polygraph is not a lie detector. That's kind of vernacular, but it's it's not. It's 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 a um, you know what what's happening is uh, you know, your physiology is being recorded, and w during that, during specific questions, we infer certain things uh, about your credibility from those tracings, but clearly it's not that there's, you know, there's some kind of Pinocchio response that says, you know, when this, if and only if this person lies, then there's a some kind of response. And so, um, you know, I do think there are, and then we can talk, but I, I think there pretty much are two basic tracks to the research in recent years. Uh, when I had started uh, my work, um, you know, in the, in the 90s, it was mostly polygraph, and it was mostly in the weeds kind of stuff, like, um, you know, what's the best set of question order, how you, you know, a ask these questions, uh, which order to ask them, uh, you know, um, uh, specific phraseologies and, and, and more in the weeds stuff, but uh, it's more the really- More component of the, of the polygraph. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Sorry, yeah, more more the interview component of the of the polygraph. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the interview component. Occasionally, you might get a new signal, but it was typically similar. So we might we've certainly looked in the old days. Uh, might say about uh, you know photoplethysmogram, and we're still looking at those kinds of things, uh, which are you know that's largely similar to the to the cardio cuff that's traditionally used. So so it wasn't. Uh, but but what's happened is in recent years, there's been a lot more. Uh, interest, frankly, uh, interest um, from mostly in from a technical perspective. There's been a lot of look at new technologies that that uh, can record some of the same information, maybe some new information like thermal imaging, laser Doppler vibrometry, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they're not measuring deception. Obviously, none of these uh, technologies are. And in fact, uh, especially with thermal and some of the others, we think they're pretty much measuring the same components, the same sort of fight or flight defense uh, uh, and uh, orienting responses that you see during polygraph. So, so given the, the sort of emergence of some of these newer, uh, newer approaches um, to assess credibility, um, I'm curious if you, uh, if the ways in which we evaluate how good those tools and technologies are, have also similarly evolved, right? Because that's really at the heart of this, of the case challenge is, how do we evaluate those tools and technologies that we use today to evaluate credibility assessment? So it seems that since we've had this evolution in the potential tools to use, to deploy, to measure credibility assessment, that the methods that we've used to evaluate things like the polygraph or some of these newer techniques um, that you're talking about would similarly uh, evolve. Have you seen that? And if not, what do you think some of the challenges are uh, that need to be addressed? Okay. Uh, great question. Uh, difficult. Um, I think that uh, um, I, I'd have to say that there hasn't been all that much evolution. Now, uh, um, uh, let me qual let me let me back up a little bit. Um, for the most part, I think uh, there are two main types of credibility assessment tests. Certainly, the types of certainly for for what polygraph does, uh, which is you know currently in the field, there there are federal, state, local examiners and, and throughout the country, U.S. and the world, using this. But um, but what you what you see is um, there are. Um, a lot of time, um, you know, there are two basic kinds of tests. So when someone, when you say polygraph to someone, the first thing I probably typically think of is, you know, a, what we would call a specific issue polygraph. That is where a crime ha or a crime has been committed and the person sitting in the polygraph chair is a suspect in that crime. And so that is, I would argue, um, the uh, slightly easier type of test to administer because 
the examiner knows what the examinee might or might not have done and therefore can frame those questions in a way uh, that is um, uh, just makes the test more effective. Yeah. Now, to get back to your question, I, um, uh, that test, uh, we have fairly effective scenarios uh, that we use. We've used at NCCA. They've been developed in the field, uh, or sorry, in academia, largely by several people. You know, going back to the 70s. But I would I would credit uh, John Kircher mm -hmm. and his crew in Utah for uh, really coming up with a, a scenario that had been shown to work um, pretty well and 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 was and was repeatable for a specific, again, a specific issue type of crime. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of screening, um, I, I know there just has not been that level of, um, of evolution that we, we certainly have done some work on screening, but it has not uh, been to that level. And I, I haven't seen, we typically use the same kinds of paradigms that we had used in the past. And frankly. could you clarify what you mean by, by screening? Yeah, so the so I, I talked about the first kind. That's the, the screening would be the second kind of test, which is uh, again being administered, um, you know, throughout the government for mostly for folks who are um, either applying for or who are are in positions of trust, maybe uh, so specific, um, typically government or maybe police officer. These types of jobs, they will take. Uh, a screening polygraph, which is essentially, it's still a polygraph, same sensor, same physiology, but the questions are different because the examiner doesn't know, has no idea what this person, they're screening for things in their past that might be a concern. But, mm -hmm. you, but so, so a, a big difference between these two types of tests is that for a specific issue test, you can get very specific, you know, did, you know, okay, did you take that money from the safe at the 7-Eleven on Saturday the 13th in the afternoon? That makes it, um, and again, I get back to the, the, to the pilot, to the Pontius Pilot thing and lying to yourself. That's where it makes it harder, makes it harder to rationalize something that you may or may not have done. Whereas in screening, the questions are a little bit more vague. And so it's still a, an effective test, but it just makes it a little more difficult, if, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. Well, and it's also, I mean, if we just bring this to sort of the everyday, we see these examples around us every single day as we, you know, as we meet new people, we get to know them. You're trying to suss out if there's someone who you really want to, you know, invest more of your time in, whether it be, you know, a, a friendship or, or a closer relationship or even, even work colleagues, right? Whether this is someone who you really want to be collaborating with and, and whether they're going to be someone who can deliver on the things, on the things that they promise. So, um, yeah, it, it seems to be a, a struggle that we not only deal with when we're thinking about these really sort of important national security problems, but also things that we face um, kind of every day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I um, agree with that. Yeah, so so in terms of um, then where you kind of think uh, the practical applications are in sort of credibility assessment techniques and technologies today, um, what do you think are some of the, the biggest challenges facing some of these end users that you talked about? So you, you mentioned a little bit about things like uh, law enforcement screening, um, but then there's also, you know, people who are trying to do hiring. Um, you know, when these people are using some of these, uh, some of these techniques, um, you know, interview techniques or some of the newer uh, technologies that, that you've mentioned, are the things that they have at their disposal sufficient? Um, and, and what do we need to be evaluating in some of these newer techniques and technologies that would help them know whether they are are worth using or are really going to be um, kind of an, an accurate tool? Yeah, sure. Um, well, as you as you said, I mean the the um, uh, there are as you know polygraph tests being administered for both specific issue and and uh, screening as we speak and uh, certainly uh, um, we we continue to research traditional polygraph but I, I also think this is an exciting time for for the future um, I think that um, 
as I had said previously, I think artificial intelligence, these kinds of uh, newer approaches uh, mm -hmm. will will create. And I, I think I think from my from my perspective, you typically see fo um, a kind of all or none strategy kind of thing, like a, what's going to replace the polygraph. And I don't think that's going to be the way it works. I think. There'll probably be some niche markets that uh, that some of these new technologies step into, either to uh, augment or to to assist, uh, you know, either specific issue or screening polygraph. Um, and there'll be some maybe maybe some surprises. I mean, I can see um, something like a uh, a neural polygraph if it, you know as it as it develops, maybe for really high uh, maybe someone on death row who wanted, you know, I mean, I could see where it would be, again, you, you wouldn't uh, administer this to everybody and everything, but it would be a, maybe a, a sort of either a high risk or a high, uh, an important where there are life or death issues involved. I could see that. Uh, so I, I think that's how it's probably going to develop. And I'm not sure I answered your whole question there, but I do see that's what I think. Mm -hmm. the, the future is looking toward, um, looking like it's going to be. Yeah, is that is does that involve um, or does, is some of the research that you're doing there at the National Center for Credibility Assessment developing some of those newer techniques and capabilities and technologies? And if so, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, and maybe a little bit about how you've been thinking about evaluating those and measuring the effectiveness of those newer techniques as well. Sure. Um, okay. Um, I think that uh, um, uh, newer techniques. So, so we when we started uh, when I started uh, uh, work at NCCA around the 2000, uh, 2001 time frame. Uh, at that point, yeah, I, I came in, and a few months later, we had nine nine eleven, wow. and. Uh, yeah, and uh, so what tended to happen, uh, there was a, an influx of um, interest, but a lot of it was theory-driven, uh, not theory-driven, I should say, uh, more technology kind of driven, mm. where, uh, you know, here, can we, if we build this really cool mousetrap, can we? And I, and I do think that Look, I think that uh, folks who are going to develop these kinds of new scenarios should be thinking about theories. They should be thinking about um, not just let's make this really, you know, cool scenario, although that's part of it, but also be thinking about, you know, how does this, I, I do think theory and, and practice, you know, go, kind of goes hand in hand. If you can figure out, like, for example, one of the papers I recently published talked about how there does appear to be one um, one sort of monolithic way that people tell the truth, but there are many different strategies that people um, have for being deceptive, and it's a it's kind of crude oh. it's, it, it's statement of the theory, but it but certainly um, you know that's an interesting thing, and it and that so imagine you now you're developing a scenario. You might, if you ha if you, you you know had that in the back of your mind, there are several ways you could go about testing that, and that might it might inform your your scenario, which might then inform your theory. So I'm I'm really I I, I am pretty strongly in favor of uh, uh, of some kind of theory driven type of research. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So then in those kinds of scenarios, you, you would think about maybe ways in which people would would be encouraged to sort of lie in different ways is that because I think that's a really interesting finding this idea that you know I think what you said sort of people tell the truth similarly but but will lie in many different ways um, so maybe trying to elicit these different types of or giving them opportunities to demonstrate sort of different deceptive kind of behaviors and then trying to recall those in different ways I think so 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 um, yeah so for example so a polygraph test is 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 very scripted. You know, they're they're, they're typically it's yes no answers. Um, some of the things we've been doing recently is we've uh, been using more open ended kind of uh, a chance for for the uh, for both deceptive or non deceptive uh, participant study participant to 
um, to 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 answer in a more open-ended way, different kinds of strategies like that. But just to give you an example, a, a, a simple example, um, some people, when they're asked about uh, sensitive information, they might um, just one strategy that I typically see is they'll just say they'll just lie right away fast, like no, no, no. Versus someone might uh, another strategy would be, um, you know, to um, uh, to actually, uh, you know, try to remember what they said before. And so, the, you know, you'll, you'll get different patterns of responses for, from somebody who who is trying to develop a, a coherent story versus somebody who who is just trying to quickly answer the questions. And I've seen that um, several times. That it's a again, it's difficult to get into the minutia, but just to tell you that 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 having that. Even for even for what it is, that kind of theoretical framework does inform and help um, help scenario development, of which especially in screening, which like I said, there's just not that many uh, studies to draw from. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what these folks can come up with. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> so what do you think are some of the other um, kind of, so, so you've, you've talked a little bit about um, sort of theory being an important thing to think about when, when thinking of a, of a new, um, when, the, de when developing a new scenario. Um, what do you think are some of the other challenges that some of the case challenge solver should be thinking about in terms of ways to you know, build upon, expand, or completely rethink, let's say, the, the more traditional kind of mock crime scenario that's out, that's out there? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think, um, well, I can just, draw, I can draw from, from, from experience. Um, I can tell you one thing. I can tell you that, um, uh, as I said before, a lot of times, uh, research is technology driven and so they um, not a lot of effort has been put into uh, as much of the effort that um, into the scenario and folks can uh, subjects are, are you know participants and studies are very smart they can figure out things it's very easy to and I've done it myself to kind of ruin a study just based on you know something you might not have, you know, you put, uh, again, and just go through a scenario. I mean, you might have a scenario where folks go through a security checkpoint and you, you, you know, we've done studies like that and where folks have to uh, do certain things and try to meet up. You, you can develop a, a, a very elaborate scenario. We had one where, um, okay, um, they were trying to smuggle prohibited items, not really, but obviously as, as part of the scenario, mock prohibited items through a security checkpoint and they would meet with their handler, you would say, and they would, they would do all kinds of things. And, and you develop this incredibly sophisticated scenario, but uh, you know, subjects, we would ask the participants after the study, what did you think you know, might have made it better? And they would say simple things like, you know, I noticed that uh, you know, maybe maybe is the way the guard looked at me. I suspected that he knew me before I, you know, be, before he should have. That he already recognized simple things that you might not think of, but can literally ruin a study. Mm. And you might go through, you know, you know, it's it's sad because the tech, you know, um, some of these studies are expensive, and you don't yeah. want you don't want to. Um, it almost comes down to attention to detail on this, <laughs> and and I also think. You know, piloting, um, um, when you run a study, make sure you do some piloting so that uh, you can get feedback from the from the participants. They're generally really, you know, if you do the study right, they're really into it. They were, you know, they're excited about it too. And they tell you, you know, hey, I might have done, done this. I've learned a lot from, from the participants. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to have people who are sort of engaged and, and pointing out uh, some of the things that you you maybe have have overlooked um, and haven't. I mean, they're they're creative, they're clever. Some some of the participants in our studies are, are really good. Yeah. Um, I'm curious how you so so some of the things we we think about or we've thought about uh, for the challenge um, that we would love to see people address are sort of concerns about how to get people to really make these authentic decisions to be credible or not credible. Um, how you motivate people when it's beyond just, you know, the sort of uh, traditional lab-based studies where maybe we're using undergraduates and can, can award them with, you know, extra credit points on a project. Um, 
or or even just giving them sort of low dollar amounts in order to motivate um, really kind of engaged behaviors. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if, if you've thought at all about um, not necessarily solutions, but whether those are things that, that can actually be reasonably built into scenarios to, to make the overall experience, um, particularly for these savvy participants, make the experience more real and authentic and engaging. Yeah, I don't have answers, but I can, again, I can tell you some of the things that, I can tell you all the things we did wrong. <laughs> um, but but honestly, I, I think um, one thing I would say is don't try to do too much. Yeah. Right? Um, that is a, uh, it's a, a common pitfall is, you know, one study to rule them all is not necessarily, and again, you know, um, a well-crafted, well-designed, theoretically driven study beats the all-encompassing study, which, and again, it's difficult, another related point, it's difficult to be strong or impossible to be strong in every direction. So you're going to trade, it's a series of trade-offs in my experience, and ex, you know, an expensive study uh, might be able to do more in terms of uh, um, elaborate, uh, you know, um, making the scenarios seem real, but but um, it will cost more. And also, um, you know, a, a big one we run into is the naturalistic kind of studies. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, they're they're great, um, but um, uh, you know, they're going to give up a degree of experimental control, and and that's individual researchers will have their own opinions on on this. I have always felt that it is important to have, um, you know, random assignment to groups in most cases. Um, but but again, you know, it's up to it's really going to be up to the the person designing the study what they're willing to trade off for what and how important um, whatever they're studying is to to, to um, um, you know, I, I do think you can't be strong in every direction. So right. <laughs> make it strong in whatever it's going to be strong in and, and do your best with yep. that. I think that's great advice. And we've also, for those listening, we've also tried to um, think about that element when designing the prizes for the challenge. So when you look through the different prizes we have and, um, and what we're looking for there, um, we're also interested in solutions that maybe can't come up with a full end-to-end -end successful scenario or protocol or evaluation method, but maybe are particularly strong in, in one, one specific dimension of it. Um, so I encourage everyone to, to take a look at those and, and really get a sense for um, what, where you may be able to excel um, in, in one direction or another. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, I, I want to turn a little bit, um, Dean, to kind of the future <laughs> and yeah. what the future looks like uh, to you from, from where you're sitting. Um, and I'm curious what you're, what you're kind of excited about, what you're hopeful about for, for future credibility assessments. Um, you said a little bit before that, that you know, at least, at least from your perspective, you know, at the National Center for Credibility Assessment, um, it probably still includes the polygraph, but, but what, what else should we be excited about? I mean, you've mentioned a little bit about um, artificial intelligence and how that might help people. I think that's a really interesting element and, and really sort of topical in, in our world today. Um, I'm curious, you know, what, what that kind of looks like and, and how far away do you think, do you think we really are from, from that future? Yeah. I wish I knew, but that is, that is a wonderful question. I, you know, the ball won't tell you. I, uh, yeah, um, I think that um, we're in for some some breakthroughs in the in the very near future. I don't, I can't say exactly when. I know we're due, <laughs> but I also think I did, I think it's it's. Uh, I've never been more optimistic in terms of not only the level of interest. Um, we have some some in the U.S. anyway. I know some some pretty big companies that normally wouldn't give us the time of day who are who are stepping up and, and, and getting interested in this topic, which frankly in terms of that, that's that's huge. Um, uh, re research, and, and this is my, I was always interested in the neural basis of deception, uh, even as I said when I was in grad school, but um, it just, you know, a lot of the timing is everything. I'm not sure there were some great studies, Manny Donchin and, and uh, some of the uh, stuff going back, you know, 25 years that showed, hey, this is feasible, but it sometimes from a lab prototype to a fielded uh, system takes takes a bit of doing. But I do think that is, um, 
you know, in terms of uh, neural neural AI, uh, you know, in combining neural with AI as an example, uh, doing they're doing a decent job even now, you know, figuring out specific topics that a person might be thinking about, for example. Uh, recently, um, so um, AI is a is a broad field, and every, I think I'm sure a lot of you know that that field is expanding very rapidly. Um, but I think these recent breakthroughs in, in artificial intelligence, as they you know, certainly have implications for many technologies, they certainly have implications for, um, for credibility assessment. As an example, um, you, you know, human-machine interaction is something I've been working on for about a decade, and that's really coming into its own. Um, we have, for example, artificial um, um, computer-generated agents that interview folks. That's something that is, um, it's really, uh, ma we're making slow and steady progress. But just in terms of algorithm development and, and uh, having an artificial agent, uh, so a, a, a computer-generated agent that is, in fact, intelligent is, you know, we're, we're, we're getting there as well. And so, um, it's it's a uh, it's really an interesting future. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, to see what happens in, in I think in the very near future. Um, and I would say, and I'm, we've covered this before, but again, I would just say that I think uh, findings both at NCCA and elsewhere show that deception is almost certainly an umbrella term mm -hmm. for actions that are taken as um, um, what they used to call in the old communications literature compliance gaining strategies. Huh. That deception is just that again, it really does appear that deception is not you know a monolithic thing it's um at, at least that's what uh, so so if that is true, I think that uh you know uh, things like um neural networks and uh and, um machine learning um you know natural language processing um uh, sentiment analysis, all of these things are going to uh, have implications for, for uh, credibility assessment. Oh. And I think already are having and in the very near future will uh, may be the game changer. Yeah, there are two, two points there I want to pull on. One, could you talk a little bit more about what you mean by compliance gaining strategies? I think that may mm -hmm. be a new term for some people. Yeah, it probably, it's actually an old term. I don't know if they're still using it, but that, um, Essentially, the idea goes back to oh God, the um, philosopher, I think it was Wittgenstein, but it's basically the idea is that language is, is really, it's, 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 it's functional. It's, it's, for, it's to be used, you know, like any other tool. And the idea is that um, essentially, if you can look at, uh, it'll, it'll take a polygraph as an example. You have an examiner and an examinee. Um, both have both want certain things. Maybe let's say you have a deceptive. Let's just hypothetically, you have a deceptive someone who is lying about a specific crime that they were involved in, and you have an examiner who who doesn't know and is trying to find out. Well, one strategy is to be deceptive, but there are many other strategies that could go into play throughout the uh, the course of that interaction. Uh, ultimately, what the examinee wants is to walk away uh, with the examiner not uh, thinking that they're deceptive. And so, um, uh, you know, I don't have a specific reference, but it was the old communications literature that came up with that term. I don't know if specifically who did, but I think it's a good way of conceptualizing um, what, um, you know, what, it's almost game theory. You can you know, a lot yeah. of game theory in that, um, but but the idea is that uh, you, you know deception itself. Uh, how should I put this? Um, uh, can be can be further broken down into its yeah. elements. Yeah. Yeah, and actually, I know, um, and, and you know as well, you know, game theory has been kind of a, a useful jumping off point for some for some research uh, groups around who've been developing um, protocols to evaluate different credibility assessment techniques. Um, I'm curious, in sort of this, this future world that you're kind of painting for us, um, you know, could bring it again back to back to the case challenge of what we're trying to achieve here. Do you think that the methods we would need to evaluate things like AI or human-assisted AI would be fundamentally different than 
uh, the, the methods that we use to evaluate what, what I'll call sort of more traditional credibility assessment techniques? Or do you think that it doesn't matter what the actual technique, technology is, the, the methods will, will be the same? Um, uh, it just, the, the end point will be. Right. That's a, that's a great question, and I'm going to try to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think to some extent it will matter. And here's here's why I think that. Um, it, um, not to disparage current, well, let me disparage some of my own current research that, or <laughs> past research that I don't want to, you know. It's, it's very easy to be a theoretical in this field. I don't know why. It's very easy to be almost, even when you're, let's say you're developing an algorithm, it's very easy to just, okay, let's just throw all these, you know, features, all these million features that we can collect with our fancy, you know, uh, fancy devices and come up with, you know, something that, uh, you know, looks like an algorithm and just, and, and separates deceptives from non-deceptives. But, but actually what, what is important in addition to, you know, who's who is the questions that you ask them, their answers, their responses, um, and all those things, uh, specifically with AI will become important. Let's say if you talk about um, sentiment an analysis or um, some of the things that they're doing now, well, depending on what someone says and depending if you get a large enough database of, of what sort of a deceptive response to look like, uh, you may redesign those tests to uh, specific to those results. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. 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 And so, so to a degree, I think, um, I think it will matter, uh, you know, who's doing the testing or how they're doing, or sorry, who's doing the evaluating, um, or what's doing the evaluating. Yeah. Uh, but to some extent, it won't, because it, again, you're still going to need, you're st it's still people. They're still, um, y you know, um, people have not changed, and the way the way that they respond to their social situations are going to be. I would guess <laughs> similar over the over time. So, yeah, so I guess I guess I people stay the same, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I've, if I may, I probably that was a pretty good non-answer. But anyway, that's that's <laughs> <laughs> probably what I think. Um, but it'll be it'll be fascinating to see how that how that turns out. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, so in just the the last few moments, um, I just wanted to find out. I mean, given that you've you've been in this uh, research area for for quite a while now, you've created um, research protocols and sort of scenarios on your own. Um, what what other advice would you give to uh, someone who's interested in, in putting together a solution for the case challenge? Um, I mean, you talked a little bit about you know be be specific, be thoughtful. Um, maybe consider theory, um, more of these theory-based approaches and, and how we're defining credibility um, and thinking about credibility. Is there, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to put put out there? Uh, yeah, again, and uh, I, I think that's that's pretty good cover, covers it. Uh, I would say too, again, focus on the details, especially with, you know, um, folks are smarter than you. You, you, <laughs> you may have a great idea, but it might not work. So. So I would I would try to um, again pilot testing and asking the folks we've because I can't tell you we've we've had studies that uh, you know didn't do so well because of little things like I said where we put the trash can you know so so that kind of attention to detail uh, some kind of theory driven I would say this you know you might think uh, of doing um, almost like a grant application with you know. Uh, where you have maybe three or four, I'm not saying, you know, a whole body of research, but maybe, well, if this turns out like this, then we'll do this other study uh, to show that uh, there's a there's some thought that goes into not just, hey, we've got this really cool whiz-bang scenario, but we've also put some thought into how this would move the field, how this would uh, affect, uh, you know, future studies by other groups going forward. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, that's really useful, putting it into, into the broader context and how you might move it forward even further. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just one one final question then, um, since you are also very familiar um, with kind of the literature and the research in this field, um, just off the top of your head, and we'll certainly post some of these for, uh, for some of our listeners and, and the challenge participants, but do you have particular... Um, readings or uh, authors or, um, you know, really
really important papers that you found to be useful, books, um, even, you know, you know, in sort of our, our more modern day, you know, like podcasts or, um, you know, videos that you find to be, or speakers that you find to be particularly compelling or useful uh, resources in this area. Sure. Yeah, I I think that uh, I had, I think I mentioned his name earlier, but John John Kircher's been doing this for many years. John is um, I mean he would if you look at some of the older literature, just to give you a, a little background back before uh, sort of uh, in the maybe 70s and 80s there was a big controversy with polygraph, you know, whether uh, in the scientific community, even with uh, specific issue studies. Um, and John really did a good job of sort of showing, hey, you know, the polygraph works, you know, and he would, he would be able, we'd, we've certainly replicated some of his, his results. I would take a look at some of the work, I think it was in, uh, he published in the 80s, um, which was um, developing a sort of what he affectionately called the uh, the mission impossible scenario. One of the one of the things that he he advocated, you know, not too much contact between the um, between the participants and the study personnel. Sort of make it seem like they're on their own. There were there were several things that he did. I think really interestingly, and and, and it seemed to work. I mean, and the proof was in the pudding. He would routinely get on specific issue. Um, you know, mock crimes, he would be able to detect deception on using polygraph accurately, very accurately, and sometimes up into the 90s. And so I would, I would definitely take a look at uh, at John's work for sure, uh, and his colleagues at the University of Utah, which includes um, or used to be <laughs> at the University of Utah. So someone like Charles Hans and uh, and and Dave Raskin, I would look at that stuff. Uh, they've done exemplary work, uh, in my opinion. But um, I also, again, I uh, f for some of the newer technologies, fMRI kind of technology, look at Peter Rosenfeld's work with uh, ERPs and evoked potentials, and uh, Giorgio Gannis, and I think his his um, his mentor Stephen Coslin, um, they did some work with types of deception that I thought were was extremely creative and definitely uh, he was on the right track or is I'm not sure if he's uh, still involved with deception research yeah sorry uh, quick. just for everyone's awareness so fMRI would be functional magnetic resonance imaging so brain imaging um, brain imaging right. at a like, sort of tube to scan your brain and then uh, ERPs being event related potentials which is something that you can measure um, Sort of another measure of sort of brain activity um, using an EEG device to do that. So. Yeah, so that that's just off the top of my head. And again, this 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 may not. I'm not saying go out and do. <laughs> for me, this is how I can say is for me. Uh, reading this has really uh, informed my 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 research. Yeah. Um, I find a lot of value in looking at some of the uh, some of the literature that uh, interviewers. Uh, it used to be so interview and interrogation by uh, Reed, uh, Johnny, Johnny Reed. That goes back many, many years. I mean, I think to the 50s and 40s. But he would, he, uh, they, uh, they had a, I think it was a company in Chicago, but they would, um, you know, train, train uh, professionals on how to interview. I find some of that literature uh, fascinating. And you get some of the real world kind of uh, problems and issues. Um, I had been, I had read a couple articles from from psychologists who are more again very applied trying to develop maybe behavioral tests of yeah. deception um including uh, uh dr fiona gabbard in the uk uh Algert, um uh Vry in the netherlands um I, and i think that some of that applied work is very useful to take a look at um the name escapes me. There's there's a couple of uh, there's actually some uh, some work that had looked at, at um, the confession literature that kind of thing uh, that that really helped me in specific ways to see okay what what is it that deceptive folks do when they're being deceptive mm -hmm. um, and uh, also I would uh, finally I would say the neuro uh, the National uh, Academy of Science report I know you had that I looked at, I saw that you had that referenced in your yep. website. Obviously, that uh, we were a uh, little background. We were involved with that. I was here when that uh, study, when that uh, uh, study was commissioned, uh, and um, 
I really, I really enjoyed reading that book, and I think it really does, in a sense, in some ways, it's kind of depressing because what they did not do is come up, hey, just you know, there are a lot of smart people in the national academies, and they picked, you know, some cream of the crop folks that would be able to, you know, look at this, look at the problem of uh, uh, of credibility assessment and designing these kinds of studies, and they really sort of. I want to say threw their hands up to some degree, but it does, you know, they pointed out a lot of the problems <laughs> that uh, the, that are that researchers are faced with. So I think that's a good starting point, maybe, for folks who don't have a really good background in this as of yet. Yeah, I agree. That is a definitely a great resource, and there's a uh, I think a PDF of it that you can get free free on the web, and it's a really good resource. And we'll we'll make sure to highlight um, some of those other. Um, researchers and authors that you pointed out, and of course your own work. So I know you're too humble to mention it, but um, you know you've done a lot of work in this area yourself. So you have a lot of uh, really quality papers um, that I think some of them we've already highlighted in, in prior uh, material that we have on the site. But we'll make sure to, to pull out some others. Um, so I just I, I want to thank you again, um, Dean, for for taking the time to talk with us today. Hopefully, um, some of the ways you've been thinking about credibility assessment has been really useful um, to some of our solver community in, in hearing about that. Um, any last thoughts or, or insights you, you want to provide? Uh, I don't really have any any last insights, but I do. My thought is I would really I'm really looking forward to some new. Uh, uh, as well as you know I think that um, I can only speak for myself and staring at the same problem you kind of get sort of uh, blinded to certain issues I think that uh, I'm hoping to see some new faces and some maybe some beginners luck and some you know as well as some of the people that have been doing this for a while um, uh, I think it's great I really I, I think that the the idea behind this this challenge is really interesting and uh, looking forward to seeing what uh, what we get Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I, I really do appreciate your time. Um, thank you all who listened um, and who joined us today. <laughs>